Okay, so we are continuing with the discussion of particular solutions for the state equation system. So last time we have covered this example. So this is a second order circuit with two dynamic components as you see. And it can be represented in the state equation form like this one. Last time we have covered this. And equivalently you can represent it in a scalar differential equation form. Let's say in terms of the representation variable Vc as you see over here. So what is the difference? Well, this is a first order differential equation because there is only first derivatives are involved. But the unknown is a vector and I have a 2 by 2 matrix over here. Okay. So over here you have a scalar differential equation. There is only one unknown, Vc of t function, but second derivatives are also involved. So this is a scalar second order differential equation. This is a first order matrix differential equation. So today we are interested in the particular solution of you know this state equation system. But before that, let's remember how we handle you know this particular solution finding as we did in EU201 and in the differential equation course for the scalar case. So uh, our focus is our focus is on the exponential input. What do I mean by that? Vs of t is equal to e to the s not t. Okay, so you can say that this is a rather limited focus on the exponential functions, but this is, I believe, good enough because we are taking s naught as an arbitrary complex number. So this complex field symbol. So for example, s naught can be, I don't know, minus 1, 2, minus 5, 4j, or 1 plus j, etc. Okay, this may go like that. So this may be a decaying exponential, this may be blowing up exponential, it can be, well, this complex value, purely imaginary, that case will be related with cosines and sines. We will be seeing it eventually, like in a few weeks or so. So this will be the uh, closer related to our AC analysis topic, complex valued exponentials. Okay, but whatever the case is, so I know the value of this S naught, and then I would like to find the particular solution to this input. So what do I mean by this? Well, this is my input, as you see. Okay. And I'm declaring, for example, in this representation, output as Vc of t. I'm only interested in Vc of t over here. Given this input, I would like to find Vc of t in response to that input. Well, for this one, input is affecting this differential equation, right hand, it's appearing on the right hand side of this differential equation, and it is shaping Vct, Ilt, starting from this initial condition according to this rule, okay, the state equation rule. So our goal is, obviously, you know, finding, we are focused on this, the complete solution. So what is the complete solution? This is the homogeneous solution plus the particular solution. So right now we are focused on the particular solution. So last time we have covered the homogeneous solution. So what do we do for this one? Now we say that the input is e to the s not t. So what's the meaning of particular solution? Particular solution focuses on this differential equation. And given that on the right hand side right now I have 2e to the s naught t. I am looking for a function which I call vc p function whose second derivative plus 3 times first derivative plus 2 times that unknown function should be equal to e to the s naught t. Okay? So for example, let's say that this is equal to t. I have 2t. So I'm looking for a function which is differentiated twice plus 3 times its derivative plus 2 times itself should be equal to 2t. For example, what kind of function can it be? Can it be a trigonometric function? Because it cannot be a trigonometric function because if I write sine function over here, well, I get sines and cosines after differentiation on the left-hand side, and I can never get 2t. In other words, I cannot satisfy this equality for all t greater than zero. Okay? 
So for all t greater than 0, left hand side and right hand side should be equal to each other, but it's not possible. Again, if this is equal to 2t on the right hand side, so can I have, let's say, t square in the particular solution? Well, you have 2t square then, so this derivative will be, uh, it would be 6t after differentiation, this would be plus 2, etc. But you see that you have a t square term over here, so you have a quadratic in terms of t on the left side, but this is just a linear function. So you can see that those function, try to sketch them in your mind, they will not be equal to each other for all t. The reason is, t square function and t function, they are linearly independent from each other, and they cannot be, when combined, you know, they cannot have, if you move this to the other side, you cannot have zero for all t's. That equality cannot be satisfied. So what is our goal? If this is my input, so not t, something like that, but this is my input, and then I should make a guess so what is this guess? I say that here is my guess for the particular solution. This. Again, in this case, I reduce the problem to a parametric problem, as you see. So previously, I was looking for a function. Now I'm looking for a parameter of this function, because S0 is right now known. So this function shape is, form of this function is fixed. So given this, if this guess is correct, it should satisfy this differential equation. Now, let's check. Insert into differential equation. Insert into differential equation. If that is the case, the second derivative of this is needed. So what is special about the exponential function is if you differentiate it, the form of the function remains. Only thing is that this s dot, once you differentiate it, it comes to the front as a coefficient. So if you differentiate it two times, you have s not coming down twice. Okay. So you have s not square times the original function e to the s not t. So this is this term only. Second derivative is s not square times this plus three times the first derivative. 3, multiply, put a 3 over here, then differentiate 3 s naught k e to the s naught t, plus 2 times our guess, 2 times our guess should be equal to 2 e to the s naught t. And this is supposed to be satisfied for all t greater than 0. Now here is the case. Now as we did before, well I can cancel this, because this exponential is never 0. I can always divide by it. So if that is after the cancellation, I observe that this equality for all times becomes time independent because I have cancelled this time dependence term. So this was really nice. Now I can find my coefficient for equality of this as this one. Okay? So this is my k. So if this is your k, then we are done. Particular solution is two s not square three s not plus two e to the s not t because my guess was only thing that I don't know was this and I have found it so this is my particular solution then what do I do now this particular solution is found in right over there how about the homogeneous solution homogeneous solution is maybe something like this a1 e to the lambda 1t plus a2 e to the lambda 2t. Okay, this is the homogeneous solution. Again, these lambdas are the natural frequencies. And again, this is unknown coefficients of the homogeneous solution right now. Then you say that at zero, let's say that this is also satisfied. At zero, I have this and that derivative. And you try to solve this problem by selecting a1 and a2 such that these initial conditions are satisfied, okay, at t is equal to zero. So there can be cases that there can be jump in these initial conditions. So when you have an impulsive input and so on, but essentially you try to select a1 and a2 such that these initial conditions are satisfied at t is equal to zero, meaning that you, know, you satisfy this initial condition and you go ahead. In many problems, 
these initial conditions, like in differential equations course, are given at t is equal to zero. So you, you always have that, but in our course, uh, you always have you know, t is equal to zero values. But in our course, there can be jumps. Because of that, we should be a little bit careful. Uh, impulsive apex can be you know, creating discontinuous in the initial condition. So that is the case for the scalar differential equation. Now, let's try to do the same thing for the state equation. So, again, our focus is, let's keep this. Again, the exponential input So what should I do? Now I start from this one. So my input is e to the s not t. Okay. So what should I do? Now I make a guess. But since I have two functions involved, I'm trying to find a particular solution of the state equation system. So I will be writing the particular solution of this thing as k1, k2, e to the s dot t. Okay, so of course I'm making a guess for this state vector. This is my state vector. This is my A matrix. And here is the derivative of the state vector. This is B, that is it. Okay, so I'm making this guess for the particular solution, particular part of the state vector. Now what should I do? No surprises. If this is correct, insert into differential equation. Okay, so differential equation, left hand side, I need a derivative of this. So how can I calculate the derivative of that? So let's go this way then. So let me write x dot of t is equal to k1, k2, time derivative of this thing, s naught, e to the s naught t. Okay, I have written this. And right hand side should be, well, I have a matrix. Let's do not write it one more time. k1, k2, times my guess for, I'm trying to satisfy the differential equation with this guess, okay? So this is the particular solution. Guess, zero, two, and I have Vs of t as the exponential function. So now I need to have the equality of this, as you see. And this equality should be valid, as I have said, for all times after the initial condition. Again, the same thing happens. I can divide by e to the s not t. So the reason is, if input is exponential, if you make a guess like that, the same exponential appears everywhere in this differential equation. So at every term you have an exponential, okay? With the same, let's say, rate and so on, okay? With the same s not value at every term that you see. So then you can cancel them. That is the idea, because differentiation does not change, does not alter the form of this function, just scales it by multiplying by s naught and so on. So now I'm looking for the solution of this. So how can I you know, have that? So again, let's put, uh, let's try to combine these terms together. Do you agree with this? So what's going on? So first thing, I have moved this s naught, this is a scalar, over here. I can always do that. So on my first equation, I have s naught times k1 is equal to minus 3 times k1 plus 1 times k2, because A matrix is, as you see, over here. So I need an equation for that. 
this is equal to zero. Okay. So how can I write that? Well, I want to write it systematically. So I'm introducing an identity matrix over here. Okay. So I get this term, S0 times identity matrices right now over here. S0 identity k vector. So A times k vector is moved to the left side. So I'm left with this. So if I write this, maybe if I write this part, and minus A, I need this minus A. So this is this matrix. Okay. So again, if you check this equation system, S0 times K1, S0 times K1 plus 3K1, because I have moved this to the other side, minus K2. So the first equation is exactly what you want. So what, what is the deal with this identity matrix and so on? Actually, you should be a little bit careful because now this vector is, this vector is the common vector of the left and the right side, but this is appearing on the right hand side of this A. So I'm moving this vector again to the right side of this identity matrix so that I can collect the terms from the right, common terms from the right like that. So I'm putting these terms, uh, collecting the common terms and putting the other factors as a bracket, multiplying that common term. So if I do that, I have to combine, as you see, two matrices. I have add two matrices. This is important because, as you see, matrix multiplication is not commutative. So you have to be careful. This K1 vector is always appearing on the right side of it. So it should be appearing on the right. So this is the reason that we have done that. Well, essentially, this is the equation system that we have. Again, what do I want to find? Well, I know everything other than these two you know, coefficients. So I should be able to get these coefficients, provided that I can take the inverse of this matrix. Okay. So how do you calculate the inverse of this matrix? Well, you exchange their locations. Okay. And alter the signs of the octagonal terms. Please think about this and make sure that you understand why. How about this delta? Delta is a determinant. Again, we have discussed this many times. Plus two. Okay. So that is the end. So we have found K1 and K2 if this calculation is correct. So let's try to find it. One over S0 square plus 3s0 plus 2, so this is 1 over delta, times 0 times the first column, 2 times the second column of this matrix. Okay, so 2, let me put this 2 over here then, 2, 1, s0 plus 3. Okay, so this is, one more time, my k1, k2 vector. Okay, k1, k2 vector is found like that. So this is the vector that I'm looking for to find the, to finalize the particular solution. Okay. So is this the end? This is the end for the particular solution, but okay, previously we have found this particular solution from the scalar differential equation. It turned out to be this. Now, what is the connection with this one and this one? So we see particular is k1 times e to the s naught t. Let's see. K1 is indeed the same. So we get the same answer, which is good. So we have consistency of solutions. Okay. Now, what else can I do? Well, if I am done with this, the next step is, now you should do, let's erase this, to finalize the solution. You should write the complete solution as follows. This is the homogeneous solution and this is the particular solution. Okay. Again, the same comments, linearity is in action and so on. 
So if I add homogeneous solution to this particular solution, what do I mean by to this particular solution? So it, actually it is this thing, 1 over delta 1 S0 plus 3 e to the S0 t is my particular solution, delta is, you know, over here and so on. Is it 1? This is 2, I guess. So this is the particular solution. If you add a homogeneous solution to this, do I still satisfy this differential equation? Do I need to check it one more time? We don't. Because the homogeneous solution, when you insert it into the differential equation, it brings a zero to the right hand side. Okay? So homogeneous differential equation does not change the right hand side of this differential equation. In other words, you know, particular solution plus the homogeneous solution is also this a particular solution, you may say. Okay? It also satisfies this differential equation. Furthermore, please remember we had, let me use different letters. Last time we have discussed this. This is our homogeneous solution, where lambda 1, lambda 2 are natural frequencies. But from the linear algebra viewpoint, it is the eigenvalues of this A matrix. E1, E2, eigenvectors of this A matrix. So what is this gamma 1, gamma 2? Gamma 1, gamma 2 are our unknowns. So we are almost at the end of finalizing this complete solution, provided that I can find these two. So how can I find them? Again, one more time. For any gamma value, this differential equation is satisfied. Because this homogeneous terms, uh, term is bringing a zero to the right hand side after differentiation and addition. What do I mean? If you take homogeneous solution, insert it over here, insert it over here, they will be cancelling each other. Okay? Anyway, so what should I do? Now, provided that I know the complete solution's starting point, zero. If you know this, like, for example, it starts from A, B. This is the initial condition of the problem. In many problems, they are continuous, okay? So zero minus is equal to zero plus or zero. Then you say that I, I know where it starts and from the starting point, meaning that T is equal to zero value, I can write this as, let me write it again, E1 is multiplied by gamma one, E2 is multiplied by gamma 2. Again, in the last lecture, we have discussed what this is. So right now, I'm substituting t is equal to 0 over here. Plus 2, let me write this, s0 square, 3s0 plus 2, 1s0 plus 3. When t is equal to 0, okay, this is also equal to 1. These ones are equal to 1, 1, and so on. So I have an equation like that. So what do I don't know right now is this and that. We agree. So, for example, initial condition is given as 5, 5. S0 is given to me as, like at the beginning, DC input, meaning that S0 is equal to 0. If S0 is equal to 0, I have 1 over here, 1 over 3, 1 and 3 over here. So this was 5, 5. Then if you move this to the other side, you have 4 and 2. 4 and 2 like that, okay? So you have 4, 2, and you are looking for gamma 1, gamma 2, invert this matrix, and then you find gamma 1, gamma 2. Okay. So as you see, now we are finding gamma 1, gamma 2 such that equality at t is equal to 0 to the initial conditions is also satisfied, and this is the end of solution finding for the state equation system. So what can go wrong? Well, what can go wrong is that we are, you know, over here inverting matrix, we are over here inverting matrices, and so on. So this is the case when we have invertible matrices over here. Okay. So the general theory is, of course, a little bit more complicated, but in this course we are mostly focused on the basics of this theory. And you may assume that in your problems and so on, these matrices will be turning out to be invertible. Okay. Well, at least for the time domain calculations. So, let's see. When is this one not invertible? So, this is SI minus A. Please remember that 
Well, in the homogeneous solution, we were writing the characteristic equation as lambda i minus a determinant is equal to zero. So, and these lambdas are eigenvalues of a or natural frequencies of the system, isn't it? Natural frequencies of our system. So we see that this is the same thing. So right now I'm assuming that this matrix is invertible, meaning that it has a non-zero determinant. So this tells us that invertible means it has a non-zero determinant. So this tells us that S0 shouldn't be an eigenvalue or natural frequency of the system. Otherwise, this case, I don't, know, I can, I don't have the solution for that. This is somewhat that we know actually, because uh, if Let's say uh, input is in this form, but S0 is equal to lambda 1, first natural frequency, let's say. Okay. Then, particular solution cannot be like this. So, in other words, let me erase this and rewrite it. So, the sh method shown works when S0 is not equal to lambda k. That is, when S0 is not a natural frequency of the system. So it shouldn't be a natural frequency of the system. If S0 of t, sorry, if S0 is equal to, let's say, lambda 1, the first one, then, for example, let's think about this case, d square plus 3d plus 2 vc of t is equal to 2 e to the, well, in this case, in this example, lambda 1 was, let's say, minus 1, okay? We have found it, or you can see it from here. So, it's say that, let's say that we have something like that. So, this is Vs of t is equal to e to the minus t, okay? So, you see S0 is equal to lambda 1 is equal to minus 1. If I set it like this, so my input happens to be e to the minus t, and this natural frequency is also at minus 1, so I have that. So if this is the case, so clearly, your again, your homogeneous solution is, uh, from the differential equations course, or let me write, what was I using, gamma, gamma 1, gamma 2, or let me use another letter, alpha 1, alpha 2, this. But how about this particular solution? Your particular solution, it should be not, you know, your guess won't be correct for this one. Your particular solution should be something like this, plus L times e to the minus t, okay? So you need to adjust, you know, you should multiply by t, and you need to have this term such that when differentiated, you have the equality in the particular solution of this. So there is this. Term. So your guess should also include, as you see, you know, the exponential function multiplied by t. Of course, this does not cover that kind of a guess because my guess was, as you see, there is no t dependence over here. Okay. So this is just a you know exponential. So. In this case, this method doesn't work. Again, uh, we will be using Laplace domain methods for the general solution of this system, but right now we are trying to understand how to find the particular solutions in the time domain. Okay. What is the interaction? What are the limitations, etc. Okay, now let me have to increase our understanding. So what is our final result? Our final result is 
let me copy it from here our final result is particular solution is 1 over delta delta was this this is 1 s0 plus 3 e to the s not t okay e to the s not t now let's erase this just to see what's the meaning of this let's make a mini table for example I will be writing my input okay and let's say that particular solution for the capacitor is my interest output okay so particular solution for the capacitor in the general case I have this then So I'm writing the first one. This. Okay. Now how about this? Let's say that I'm interested in DC input. S dot is equal to in other words over here, special case, S dot is equal to zero. Okay. S dot is equal to zero. So if S dot is equal to zero, this is DC. So for the DC input, well, we have the general solution. Substitute S that is equal to zero in the general solution. So you have, um, I think there was a two over here. Okay. I have this. So S that is equal to zero in the general solution. I have, again, one. Okay, because 2 over 2 times 1. Okay, interesting. So this is maybe, just to make it clear, Vs of t is this. This is Vc particular, I mean, of the capacitor. Okay, interesting. How about this, e to the minus t? If my input is e to the minus t, what will be the response to it? So for some reason, your input over here is like a decaying exponential. Okay, like something like that, e to the minus t, again, in racing. Oh, I shouldn't be writing e to the minus t, I should be writing e to the minus 3t. Sorry for that, because e to the minus t immediately gives me, since it's one of the natural frequencies, I cannot find it from, this general, from the solution. e to the minus 3t, it decays faster. So what do I have? 2 divided by, so 9, 9, is this correct? 9 minus 9 plus 2, so I again 1 over here, e to the minus 3t. Okay, I have something like that. So how about this, e to the 2t, so this time it's a blowing up exponential. If it is a blowing up exponential like this, e to the 2t. So what do I have? So this is 4, this is 6, 10, 12, 2 over 12 is 1 over 6, divided by e to the 2t, so times e to the 2t, okay. okay. I have that. Well, as you see, I can fill this table because this general solution is good enough for our purposes to fill in this table. So let's make one more, let's say that uh, if I have let's say um, 10 e to the 2t what will be the case? Okay, 10 e to the 2t what will be the case? well here is the case if I increase this input by tenfold what will be the particular solution? so that is the issue for example let's look at this one, it's easier to see now, if I increase my input tenfold, again by linearity, my first input was, let's say something, then at my second trial, at my second input, I increase this by tenfold. So the response to the tenfold increase input will be 
tenfold increased response in the particular solution. Do you see it? Why? Because if I multiply this equation by 10, by 10, as you see, I multiply by 10, then I have the equality. Then move this 10 over here, 10 times Vs of t is your new input, and you can move this 10 as the multiplier of this your earlier particular solution gets. Again, this is linearity, as you see. Linearity is an action. Now, if you have this, this is 10 times 1 over 6 e to the 2t. Now, here's one other case. Now, I want to add these two right now. 2 times e to the minus 3t plus 5 times e to the minus 2t. Okay? So, as you can imagine, the particular solution to this is 2 times e to the minus 3t, double of this, and 5 times of this, 5 over 6 e to the minus. Again, by linearity. So, why this is the case? Now, you have particular solution 1, this, satisfying this, this input. Particular solution 2, to this input, okay, so this is the solution, this is the solution. So, if I add them, now their sum is appearing over here at the input side. So, as you see, if I add these responses to these inputs also, now I have Instead of one term over here, I have two terms. I have two terms. I have two terms over here after differentiation. If you combine the first three and combine the last three, you get the first term over here, first term over there. Again, this is called linearity, linearity of the differential equation. So we see that is in action. So how about this? We haven't done this, but how about e to the j2? If I add e to the j2 over here, what will be the result? Okay, so this is 2 divided by, so I have minus 4, j squared times 4 is minus 4, so I have minus 2 plus j 6 e to the j 2. Okay, you can say that this is somewhat absurd because, I mean, how can we have a complex valued, um, let's say, voltage waveform as my input? Okay. So then, how about this? Um, let me write one more line over here. How about e to the minus j2? Under this, let's say I have this, e to the minus j2. Now, instead of s naught, you are including, you are inserting minus, well, this becomes your s naught essentially, minus j2. Okay? So if you do that, 2 minus j2. You get something like that. Okay? So, interesting thing is that so this and this, they are complex conjugates of each other. And the response is also complex conjugate of each other. Because as you see, well, these coefficients over here, 1, 3, 2, every, every coefficient is a real valued coefficient. So if I replace S0 by its complex conjugate, it's equivalent to, at the end, calculating the response first and then doing the complex conjugation. We will be discussing such things later on. Maybe this is a little bit early and too fast for such a discussion, but I have this. Now, how about this? Now, if I, one more line then. If I add e to the j2t, plus minus j2t. What will be the particular solution for this? Well, it's this plus that. We have studied this. This is the linearity in action. Plus, let me write the complex conjugate of this. Okay? So, how about this? If you add these two, you get 2 cosine t. Interesting. Why do I get 2 cosine t? Because again, these are complex conjugates of each other. I get 2 times the real part of this, 2 cosine t. Again, this is a little bit fast perhaps. How about on this side? I get 2 times the real part of one of them. So this is the first bracket, as you see, and the other bracket is the complex conjugate. As you see, wherever I see a j, if I substitute a minus j, 
it becomes the complex conjugate. So you have a complex number plus its complex conjugate is appearing over here. Then you have two times the real part of this bracket. Two times the real part of this. So the response to 2 cosine t, as you see, we are almost like studying AC analysis in the capacitor voltage becomes something like that. So let's go ahead. Let's try to calculate this a little bit more. So how can I do this calculation? So over here, 2 times the real part of 2 minus 2 plus J6 e to the J2t. So how can I calculate this? So first of all, let me simplify it a little bit. 1 minus 1 plus J3. Okay. So how about this? I multiply by the numerator and the denominator by the complex conjugate of the denominator. Then I get the following. 2 times the real part of move this to this side. Minus 1 minus J3. And multiply these two. You have 9 plus 1, 10. Because if you multiply a number by its complex conjugate, you get the, let's say, the modulus square. Okay? So 9 plus 1 is 10. You get this. Times e to the j 2t. Okay. We're almost done. So this is cosine 2t, j sine 2t. Then, let me first move this 1 over 10 out of here. So I have 1 over 5 times, let me move this minus out of here, minus 1 over 5 times, now this becomes plus, plus, we put minus over there. Okay. So I should multiply this thing by this thing and take its real part. Cos 2t, this and that. This and that makes a minus 3 sine 2t. So essentially, this becomes your response to this cosine input. So again, this will be the basis of AC analysis later on. So right now, we are trying to understand what are what can we expect from the analysis with this exponential function so again what we have used we have used this this line on the first row and we have looked at special cases this case was interesting this case is complex conjugate was interesting if i combine them together as you see i get cosine and sines you know real valued responses to the real valued inputs so this will be our task okay for maybe next several weeks, we are trying to understand the solution of state equation systems and the cases, especially related to AC analysis and so on. Okay, so we have this table. Well, maybe then, since this case, let's look at the DC case, okay, look at the DC input case for this example. So what do I mean by this? It's actually this case, DC input. So let's say that Vs of t is equal to 1 volt. This is one farad, Vc. Now, how about this? Do you remember the concept of DC steady state? DC steady state is, you have DC input, and you wait a long time, you wait a long time, and then transients die out. So once the transients are out, then you look at the response. That is called the DC steady state response. DC steady state response. So how do we calculate this? Well, we say from the circuit diagram, when, the, when, we, when we reach DC steady state, capacitor voltage will be a constant value. 
of course, it is the, let's say, the maximum possible value that this capacitor can achieve. Okay, it will be reaching a constant value. If it is reaching a constant value, then its current is equal to zero because its current is derivative of this function. So at t is equal to infinity, it's reaching zero. So you can think about it like that. You are sending some charges, positive charges, over these capacitor plates, and then capacitor reaches maximum possible the potential difference. So there are no more charges entering, obviously, from the physical viewpoint. It has reached its maxima. Capacitor is fully charged. Capacitor fully charged means you have an open circuit. Because no more charges are entering to the capacitor plate. So this becomes Vc infinity. I don't know this. And similarly, for the inductor, this becomes short circuit. Inductor is fully, we don't say charged because there is no charge in the inductor. Because you know, inductor works with flux. So it will be fully flux, you may say. It will be a short circuit. Or this time, inductor current is reaching a maximum value, then its voltage will be equal to voltage of the inductor is proportional to its derivative. Its voltage is equal to zero. So VL infinity is equal to zero. Because I have DC input, as I have said, this is actually the particular solution for different, let's say, branch variables, IL, VL, VC, IC, IC is equal to zero. But at the end, so we know that I'll be reaching a t is equal to infinity, such a circuitry, with open and short circuits. So clearly we see that VC infinity is equal to one volt. Indeed, this is the particular solution of our differential equation. So it's compatible with that, okay? So it's compatible with this line, with this line of this analysis. So similarly, IL infinity is equal to one over one divided by one over three. So you get three amperes. So let's check this from this one, okay? When S is equal to zero, you have one, zero, three, S is equal to zero, indeed, three amperes. So it should be compatible, and it is indeed compatible, with our earlier DC analysis knowledge. But what is nice about this DC analysis knowledge is that we are not writing differential equation. We are just substituting, you know, some, you may say guesses for the particular solution directly on the circuit diagram. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I say that VC infinity, my guess for the particular solution, constant k, okay? Now it produces from the circuit, uh, let's say, relationship, another DC quantity over here is equal to zero, okay? But I have a very nice circuit symbol for a branch with zero ampere currents, so I put it over here just to, you know, visually see that this is, current is equal to zero. So similarly, I'm guessing a, this is equal to L. I don't know its value, but now its voltage due to this inductor's component law, it has to be equal to zero. I'm putting it like a short circuit. So once you short and open these two components, now we are left with a resistive circuit. And this is lovely because we are very good at resistive circuit analysis from E201, and then we can handle it. And then we will be getting these guesses. So this is a very practical way of solving, finding the particular solution. But as you see, this is limited to DC case. Now, can I do something similar, meaning that a circuit-based analysis, to find these particular solutions? Okay, to find essentially this solution, a circuit-based analysis. So how can I do that? Well, let me try to introduce that. Introducing generalized phasers for particular solution of, let's say, systems to exponential inputs. Okay. So I would like to introduce this. Okay. So let's, I think we are done with this table.
So how can I introduce this? Well, let's again go back to this example. Now this will be totally circuit theoretic, I mean circuit diagram based approach. You will see what I mean. Like in DC analysis, we were not writing a differential equation for the steady state part, as you see, as you seen a few minutes ago. Now we will try to do the same thing for this one also. So I'm interested in the particular solutions. Okay. So what is the case? Now the case is I have an input like this, e to the s not t. Now I can make a guess on the circuit diagram, like we did for the DC input, I make a guess like k. Okay. So now I'm making a guess like again k, but this is my particular solution guess is this, e to the s not t. So if this is my guess, if this is correct somehow, which I know that it will be correct because I have just you know, found the solution is exactly like this. So how about this current? Can you write this current? Well, I can write that current. Of course, I'm only looking at the particular solution because you know, previously I have used the circuit configuration and the component laws to write this differential equation. Now, let's say that I don't have the differential equation, but if this guess is correct, then this current from the component law should be equal to this, isn't it? Then this would be, this is C, different derivative of this multiplied by 1. K, S naught, let me put S naught as the first coefficient. I, I have this, S naught K, E to the S naught T. So as you see, over here, I get, obviously, because of this differentiation, I get the same function, you know, exponential function, just after scaling. So this should be it, because this is the idea of making this guess. So similarly, how about this? That is, this voltage divided by 1 over 3. So this is 3k e to the s naught t. Am I right? So as you see, I'm always getting this function. And let me write this in red. I have this k. I have this coefficient is only changing, s not k. I have this 3k. So as you see, I have made this guess. And these are the implications or the results of this guess. So this is implied by it. This is implied by it. And then if I write a KCL equation over here, so incoming current is equal to, so this current plus this current, KCL, 3K plus this current, am I right? S not K. So what we are observing is that at every branch, voltage or current, I have the same type of function, E to the S. It should be like it, as I have said you know, many times before. Now, we are over here, so we have found this current also. How about this voltage? So I'm trying to evaluate everything, as you see. You know, let's try to uh, write this voltage with green. But green is not very good. Let me see. Do I have? Let's give it one last try with green. So this is 1 over 2 times derivative with current. It's its current is this, so, oh good, I should have written this 1 over 2 also in red because I should take the derivative of this current, isn't it? This is the inductor current. Take the derivative, S not comes in the front, this is the derivative. Okay, so this is, okay, let's write it. So this voltage is equal to this. So this is equal to VL of T particular solution. Okay. So anything left for all components? I mean, I have found all currents and voltages, but still I don't know the value of K over here because this was my guess. 
But what I know is, you know, at the end of this analysis, what I know is the following. So if this is, I want to use another color. If this is, let's say, ground, our reference voltage, this is according to this, e to the s naught t. Let me write it better. e to the s naught t, this potential difference due to this. And then, if you check this, this node potential is also equal to potential of this node plus VL. Or simply you write the KVL over here. Okay. So if you check that, so let me write it over here, e to the s naught t, I'm writing the KVL essential over here, is equal to this plus that. Okay. So 1 over 2 s naught, there are k's over here, let me put k also over there, 3 plus s naught, let me write it over here, and I have e to the s naught t over here. So I have written this, I need to find the voltage of this, voltage of this one is voltage of this one plus k. Okay. So let's check this green thing, 1 over 2k s naught, 3 plus s naught this, plus our guess, it should be equal. Again, like in the differential equation case, there is a cancellation of this. And from here, I should be able to find k. Okay. So if I write this, 1 is equal to, over here, 1 is equal to, so I have k, let me pull this k out, uh, I have s not over 2 plus 1. Do you agree? Pull this k out, pull this k out, so I'm left with this term, plus 1 is due to this. So what is my k at the end of this? Let's write it over here. k is 1 divided by this number, 2 over s naught square, 3 s naught plus 2. So I'm trying to find k. Okay. So I get that. So this is indeed, if you check this, capacitor voltage, this gas, particular solution was 2, I mean we have drive this maybe two times before, like in the last one hour or so. So we get the solution. Now you can think that this was indeed very practical in the sense that I didn't write a differential equation, I didn't do any substitutions, I didn't do any matrix inversions, etc. It was very nice. So how can I extend this idea? You know, this idea was very good. Essentially doing all the calculations on the circuit diagram or by K KVL, KCL equations, I'm finding the unknown coefficient in my guess. Okay? So can I do it all the time? Well, we can, provided that, again, as I have said, this exponential function, the rate of this exponential is not equal to, to the, one of the natural frequencies of the circuit. Okay? So we can always do this. So how can I handle this? Well, the important thing over here is, now let's look at this generalized phasers. So what we have seen is, if I have, you know, something like this, k e to the s naught t over here, at every branch I have the same kind of function, but this coefficient k is changing. So our idea is keeping the track of that coefficient. So what is this generalized phasor? Now if I have uh, Vc particular t is equal to k e to the s naught t, I will call this part, this is the coefficient obviously of this exponential, okay? I will call this part as a generalized phasor. So this red thing, this coefficient, you may say that why are you calling it not coefficient but phasor or generalized phasor? There will be a reason when we study AC analysis, there will be the 
phaser concept and so on. But right now, this is just an idea. I want to say something to this coefficient, and I'm calling it, let's say, phaser for the sake of simplicity. Okay. So then, let's look at the following. If I have uh, an inductor L, if the inductors this current is again in this exponential form, so let's look at its voltage. voltage of this inductor. Again, what do we see? We see the following. If I have this k, again, let's write this coefficient in red. So you take the derivative of this and multiply by L. So you get k s naught L, or something this, multiplied by e to the s naught t. Okay? So this is our fact. Now, I will introduce something like this, and I will give more details about this later on. So, I will call this IL phaser and VL phaser, and then I will do something like this. Let me write, okay, S0L. So, this will be called this will be impedance. Okay. So this is something like Z. It will be corresponding to the resistance, but this will be the impedance. So ZL will be um, coefficient, let me say, of VC P of T or coefficient of e to the s naught t in vc p of t. Or not c, I guess. This is vl. So this is the coefficient of e to the s naught t in il this. Okay? So you may be at the beginning a little bit surprised with these definitions, but the idea is very simple. Now, we observe the following. If I have such an input, the output is, voltage is the output, the result of this input, is the input times this. If you don't believe me, if you multiply this red bracket by this quantity, which we call impedance, you get the output. But of course, this is very specific. This is very specific to this kind of an input, e to the s not t input. But as we have seen from the table, it's good enough. It's fairly general also. But we have seen is that due to the differentiation and the exponential relationship. Now, if I keep the track of these coefficients, I know every branch I have the same exponential. So my goal is what happens to this coefficient after let's say differentiation, multiplication by L, etc. and etc. So this will be called coefficient of e to the s naught t in VLT. It's this inductor's phasor value. And this will be inductor's current's phasor value because I'm talking about this. So this is equal to k s naught L. This is equal to just k. So let me write this so it's visible. So if you see that the ratio is, let me write it with blue. The ratio is this. So what is interesting is that if I have an exponential input in my circuit, now, if I make a guess for the inductor current like that, I don't need to differentiate right now. I only need to multiply my current phasor, this, this k, by this impedance value to get my voltage phasor, because its definition is like that. Essentially, the main idea is I'm making use of, you know, the ratio of these two, the ratio of these two coefficients 
being independent of you know k so it only depends on l and s not the ratio depends on l and s not values and instead of differentiating in time domain and you know doing calculations i say that okay if this coefficient is k then the other coefficient is current phasor times the impedance it's just like current times the resistance is equal to the voltage kind of idea okay it's for like a very shortcut and a fast method so this is for inductor okay this is for inductor and this is called phasor domain what do i mean in the phasor domain i write phasors and this i write the impedance and so on so let's do the same thing for the capacitor let's keep this This is C. Let me make it a little smaller. Now, let's say that my, again, capacitor voltages, my guess, let's say, is equal to this. Now, my capacitor current will be something like that. This is in time domain, IC of T plus minus vc of t. How about in phasor domain? In phasor domain you represent this capacitor by the impedance of this capacitor zc. So what is the zc value? Voltage phasor of this component so it is this k divided by the current phasor. Okay. So this divided by that, 1 over S not C. This case cancel this. This is the definition of impedance. Okay. Voltage phasor divided by current phasor. Again, the unit of impedance for practical purposes, again, we will be treating this like ohm. Okay. So we will be treating this thing like an ohm. And then in phasor domain, I will be writing this current is like this. This current, this voltage is like that. So in phasor domain, it will be represented with this. How about the resistance? Resistance is very simple. So for resistance, there is not much to do. So IR of T is, let's say, K e to the S naught T. So what is the relation between IR and VR? K times R times e to the S naught T. Then how about in phasor domain? Resistance becomes, let me write ZR, voltage phasor, meaning that this bracket, divided by this. Okay. Resistance becomes R. So again, this would be IR in phasor. This would be VR in phasor. But what do I mean by that? So when I say this thing is R, I say that, well, this coefficient, K, is multiplied by R. It gives you the coefficient of this voltage waveform in the exponential form. So fundamental idea is that, one more time, if you are working with exponential functions, at every branch, you have the same exponential function. So why are you writing that exponential function all the time? Because do you remember we were canceling it for all t's, it's cancelled and so on. So why are we dealing with this exponential function all the time? So let's write this on these red coefficients. Let's focus on them. So for example, this tells me that this coefficient and this coefficient of the exponential, they are related by the ratio and that ratio is R. Okay. Similarly, this divided by that, for example, if you know this, this is, let's say, 5. This phasor value is 5, meaning that this current, is it current? This current value is 5. Okay, this coefficient is 5. 5 times e to the s naught t. Now, if you're interested in this, of course, you can differentiate and so on, because you know it's time domain behavior. But how about this? 5 times this quantity should give you the coefficient of this voltage waveform. Okay, that is it. Well, that is the case. So let's try to apply this and end our final lecture, uh, finalize our lecture on 
this analysis. So I have to erase this, and then I will make a mini table, and then we will be done. Okay, so inductor in phasor domain, it becomes S0L. So this is phasor domain. Capacitor C, it becomes 1 over S0C in phasor domain. Resistance in phasor domain, it becomes R. Okay? So let's keep this and then let's look at this one more time. One over three ohms and one farad. Now, let's say that in this input, uh, sorry, in this case, input is again e to the s not t. And let's say that we are interested in the particular solution, solutions at some branches of this circuit. So let me write it like that then, e to the s not t. Now, I want to convert this to phasor domain. Phasor domain means, I don't want to write exponential functions, but I just want to write these coefficients. For example, this coefficient is equal to 1. Okay, I want to write 1 for that one. 1. Let me write volt also, just to make it sure. How about this? Now, that component is an inductor, but in the phasor domain, you may say, in the domain where the coefficients are, uh, coefficients is the matter of interest. Now, this is S0L, okay? This is the same S0. This L is given as 1 over 2. So if you wish, I can write it S0 over 2 then, okay? So what is the meaning of this? It means the following, for example, if you know that this is 3, 3 times S0 over 2, essentially we are treating this thing like a resistance, will be the voltage phasor of this, 3 times S0 over 2. But what is the meaning of that? Now the particular solution for this inductor voltage will be 3 S0 2 e to the S naught t. Okay? So this S0 2 gives us that the ratio between voltage coefficient and the current coefficient in the particular solution is S0 over 2. This is the definition of impedance. Okay. How about this 1 over 3? This resistance, resistance is very simple. Resistance remains in this because it just you know, generates the same waveform, current and voltage, by scaling by 1 over 3. These are also ohms, but okay. How about this? Capacitor 1 over S0 C. But C is equal to 1, so let's put it 1, 1 over S0. So essentially, at the end, we will be treating this component, this component, this component in phasor domain, just like a resistor. In other words, I can um, do any analysis method that I do with resistive circuit analysis. For example, I will do node analysis right now. EA. Okay. Now, how can I do this node analysis? Because, as you see, this is acting like a resistor in the phasor domain. Because it's only, you know, combining, co um, it's only, let's say, connecting the coefficients between the voltage and the current, just like a resistor does. Okay. Only difference is that right now I have this S not appearing over here in the resistance. Only the resistance, resistors, resistance values appearing in the phasor domain. Okay. Very good. So if I write KVL, or not KVL, sorry, KCL at this node, at let's say A, this node, this is A, let's say, then I have what? EA divided by 1 over 3. 
So what's the meaning of this, by the way? So I'm right now making a guess for EA. I'm assuming that EA is equal to a constant, so in phasor domain. So what is the meaning of this? I'm assuming that EA of t is equal to k e to the s naught t in time domain. So given this guess, I can calculate this current and so on as we did before. But I'm not going into those details, but that is essentially what we mean. So EA, I don't know it's really, maybe k, maybe 5, maybe 6, but if this is EA, okay, in phasor domain, a number, which is the coefficient in the time domain expression, so then I can find this current. Plus, how about this current? Oh, okay, I can write it in terms of this one also. And then I'm over here. So this current is EA minus 1 di divided by this S0 over 2. So if I well um, collect all of these terms together, I have 3 over here, plus I have S0 over here, plus 2 over S0 from this one is equal to 2 over S0. Am I right? 2 over S0 on the right hand side. So EA, my unknown quantity, is, let's erase you know, the table for the phasor domain mapping. Then EA is equal to this thing. Let's multiply by S0, both sides. S0 square plus 3S0 plus 2. S0 square, 3S0 plus 2. And I have 2 over here. EA becomes this. Okay. So what was EA? EA was actually VC, this thing, in phasor domain. Because potential difference of let me write this. So again, VCPH means phase, actually that's, there are so many things in action. VCPH means phasor domain representation of this particular solution of this circuit to an exponential input and this VCPH refers to the coefficient. Coefficient over here. So this is VC particular solution is VCPH e to the this. In other words, this is again found one more time over here. This. So as you see, this is extremely practical. We are not writing the differential equation if you are interested in the particular solution only, which can be the case in many applications. You are not interested in the transients, like in the DC analysis. What will happen if I apply input? So what will be the response? to that input. So if you are interested in this you know, particular solution for an LTI, dynamic circuit, then you can use this method. In other words, without writing any differential equations, in phasor domain, we can keep track of the ratio between this voltage and the phasor phasor, voltage and the current phasors by the impedance quantities, and do an analysis exactly we do. Like, this is node analysis, I could have done mesh analysis, I can do source transformation, anything is possible right now. I can calculate Thevenin and Norton equivalence. At the end, at the end of my analysis, I'll be getting the phasor value of this you know, node phasor value or the phasor value of this capacitor voltage. And then, by remembering that this phasor value corresponds to the coefficient, I finalize my solution, which is exactly the solution that we get like two or three times before, like this thing times e to the s not t. Okay, that's all for today. We will continue with more discussions later on.